Uh, today we have an interesting topic uh, here. Uh, it's wildlife forensics using DNA to protect wildlife. Um, and to start it off, uh, I will first tell a little bit uh, about me. I'm currently sitting somewhere here, higher up uh, above the Arctic Circle, which is here. Uh, um, and here are pictures from the area. I'm here in this building, right here. Uh, and this on this side here is Russia. Uh, I'm uh, a biologist and I usually work with bears. Um, uh, and uh, due to the fact that we here in our lab once help with a criminal investigation, we thought it would be an interesting topic to tell you a bit about wildlife forensics. Oh, here is another picture. At the moment, it looks like this year. We have uh, still winter time. So while you others are already seeing flowers and hear birds singing, we still have the nicest part of winter actually up here. Yes, so to start, uh, I will give you first a short introduction to wildlife forensics, what it actually is, uh, and then uh, lead you over to some important aspects and methodological uh, approaches. And uh, then I will give you some real life cases. It's all, uh, I find it quite exciting, actually. So to start it off, what is actually forensic science or forensics? Uh, it is the application of science to criminal laws during criminal investigations. Uh, and its aim is to produce evidence which follows legal standards so they are admissible in court uh, um, in uh, uh, cases of, uh, uh, you know, somebody has done something against the law. I think you, many of you are probably a little bit f uh, familiar with it because there are so many, um, there are so many series on TV and movies where uh, crime scene investigators, for example, play a prominent role. But um, many of you may not be so familiar with uh, the fact that um, also for wildlife crimes, you have something uh, that is called wildlife forensics, which follows you know, about the same aims and methods as we do in human forensics, where humans are involved. Uh, but it's a little bit uh, different that it's a little bit more interesting, uh, a little bit more difficult, in fact. Um, in uh, wildlife forensics, we deal mostly with DNA analysis. And the crimes that uh, come to court include uh, animal cruelty, poaching, uh, so the uh, illegal shooting of animals uh, from the wild, and illegal collection and trade. Uh, one of the mm, base uh, treaties that uh, is used to help against animal um, uh, crimes or wildlife crimes is uh, something that is called CITES, which is an international agreement between governments. That, uh, is something that is uh, um, uh, present uh, all across the world, and the aim is to ensure that international trade of wild animals and plants do not threaten their survival in the wild. So that shows you also that, um, in fact, uh, with wildlife forensics, it's very often illegal trade uh, that is the focus uh, here. On many of the cases involve illegal trade of animal parts or live animals, or dead for that matter. Uh, CITES operates uh, so that uh, for import or export or re-export, and introduction of species covered under this convention, there's a vast amount of species covered here, need to be authorized through a licensing system. And um, you have three appendices, I'm just going shortly uh, through it. You have appendix one, which uh, regulates uh, species that are threatened with extinction. So this is the most strict. An animal or plant that is on this list here, uh, is only permitted to be traded under exceptional circumstances. Under Appendix 2 are species that are not necessarily threatened with extinction, so there are still a satisfying number of them in the wild, 
but in order to avoid that um, this uh, status changes, uh, trade of um, species or of, of individuals from this species must be controlled. And then Appendix 3 is the least uh, strict. Uh, this retains to animals that are protected at least in one country, and this country uh, turned to the CITES organization or the CITES parties for, insist for assistance in controlling the trade. So this is the least strict. So this CITES document is very important, actually, for the things that I'm going to tell you. Um, there's a difference between human forensics and wildlife forensics. In human forensics, as you probably uh, guess from uh, the movies or, or TV shows you have seen, is that in human forensics we are dealing just with one species, with humans, and we are dealing with uh, individual identification in most of the cases. So it's always uh, who has, which of these persons has committed the prime, crime, and then you know you collect evidence at the crime scene and then you try to match the suspect with the uh, samples on the crime scene, right? In uh, wildlife forensics, this is a little bit different. There it is most often species identification. So we need to confirm or find out which species is it actually that has been traded because there are many species that look a little bit alike and not all of them uh, fall under CITES, for example. So for not all of them, it's illegal to trade them or transfer them from one country to the other. And then there is the topic of geographic origin. Um, for many species that uh, are interested, uh, interesting for other people to have zoos, for example, or private collectors and all this kind of stuff, uh, there are many species that are actually bred in captivity. And these in captivity bred species are often uh, allowed to be traded. So one zoo can exchange individuals, for example, with another, another zoo. Um, but it's illegal, for example, for someone to catch an animal in the wild and then send it to someone else. So if you have, for example, tigers uh, bred in captivity, those for those apply other rules than uh, tigers in the wild and for this geographic origin one aims to uh, solve um, or, or find out where does this animal come from does it really come from captive breeding for example or was it caught in the wild and then in some cases uh, you have individual identification just as with the humans whereas here it's not the suspect that needs to be individually identified but more uh, the animal in question. So uh, in case, for example, someone has um, uh, shot an animal with the gun and there is blood on the gun, is this really the same animal that we found dead that has been shot with this gun, for example? There are certain challenges in wildlife forensics that we do not have for human forensics. We have a vast number of species and not all of these species um, we don't know a lot about uh, all of these species, so it may be that we have never worked with these genetically, so we don't have any samples, we don't know exactly how to analyze them. Um, so sometimes in uh, cases of wildlife forensics, you have to start at the beginning, uh, so it's starting with a blank slate, so it's a little bit more challenging. And then you need to have knowledge about the putative source population. If you have, for example, a tiger and you think that, oh, maybe it is it was caught in the wild, which is illegal, you need to know something about the wild population of tigers in order to find out whether this animal, this tiger, for example, really comes from the wild population. And this is sometimes also... Um, uh, very tedious because you may not know something about the, the wild population. And then the marker choice, I'm going to tell you uh, right after this a little bit more about markers, genetic markers, is important relative to the case, um, especially when it comes to species or individual identification. The types of samples that uh, people dealing or, or doing wildlife forensics 
um, have to deal with is humongous. We have tissue, there's hair, there's feathers, there's tusks from elephants, um, claws from uh, tigers, there's tanned leather, bile crystals. Here, this is a picture. There's a illegal bear bile trade uh, because it's supposed to possess some magical um, uh, characteristics, and that's why it's traded. Uh, you have scales. Here's a picture of scales from pangolins. Um, you have shells. Uh, you have uh, processed animal parts and derivatives from traditional Chinese medicine. And you have the, uh, objects made of animal parts. For example, here is a picture um, of uh, seal stamps from Japan, which are made traditionally out of ivory. And there is a large uh, market for this. Uh, so. Uh, there is sometimes suspicion that the ivory uh, does not come from legal sources, but from illegally poached animals uh, and um, food, of course. Uh, something about marker choice. Um, there is a vast amount of different uh, genetic markers, but one that is uh, used very often and mostly is mitochondrial DNA or mtDNA. Mitochondria uh, are um, certain organelles, so you know, something that parts of our cells, of all um, actually animals and plants, um, apart from bacteria. Uh, so all cells of, uh, you know, large amount of uh, organisms that live on this planet today contain mitochondria. And these are uh, responsible for converting energy for cell usage. So when you're eating something, a piece of bread for example, it's the mitochondria who transform this energy from food into a form that the cell actually can use. Mitochondria are inherited only by the mother with a few exceptions and um, because of its uh, properties, it is often used in phylogenetic studies, so uh, research in how the species evolved on this planet. And in wildlife forensics, it's often used for species identification. Another marker that is often used is short tandem repeats. Uh, here you have a strand of DNA, uh, and um, I'm not going too deep into this, but a microsatellite is an area of uh, the DNA which has a repetitive structure. You can see here that suddenly you just have this number, these uh, letters GC, GC, GC. Uh, so it's a very um, peculiar area on the DNA which is used uh, often for individual identification. Uh, you can use it for finding out about geographic origin and sometimes you can use it for species uh, identification. But mostly it's these first two that uh, SDRs are used. So you see it's uh, very important to find out uh, when you're supposed to find out about uh, uh, species identification, it's often better, better to use mitochondrial DNA. If it's individual identification or geographic origin, you use, for example, uh, short tandem repeats or SDRs as they are also uh, called. There are other markers, but um, I don't want to go too deep into this now. Um, so now the most exciting part, wildlife forensic in action. So the first case here is about birds. Uh, these are Australian birds, black cockatoos. Uh, birds and parrots are very popular birds because of their plumage. Uh, and their ability to mimic uh, uh, human speech, for example. So, I mean, many people find uh, parrots and cockatoos very entertaining. But this means also that there is um, a very active, unfortunately, illegal black market for um, birds captured in the wild. And because uh, captive breeding uh, does not satisfy, apparently, um, the market. So many of many of the bird species are actually threatened in the wild due to illegal trade or an illegal capture from the wild. You can see here uh, there is an estimate. It's very difficult to pinpoint it. Uh, pinpointed it to a, a 
you know, exact number, uh, but there is an estimate that as much as 5 million birds yearly are extracted from the uh, wild. This is a large amount. And unfortunately, also, many of these birds extracted from the wild die later on. Um, so there's a huge loss of bird life here as well. Um, there's one bird, for example, Spix macau, uh, a recent example of a species going extinct due to illegal capture. Um, for this bird, for example, the prices on the black market soared to uh, 20,000 Australian dollars to capture the last of these uh, birds. So you can see there is a very large financial motivation to deal uh, in uh, illegally captured wildlife. In this case, uh, there was uh, a man in uh, December, on December 9th, 2008, this was in Australia, was photographed um, by a concerned member of the public uh, climbing into a tree. And this guy who photographed this guy uh, captured also the license plate number on the vehicle. These photographs were sent to the Nature Protection Branch and a search warrant was issued. So then the uh, official uh, uh, persons went to the property of this man and searched it. And they found uh, um, a nestling. A nestling is a bird that cannot fly. Uh, so it's, uh, it has feathers already, but it's uh, still uh, so young that it has not um, uh, attained the ability to fly. So this nestling was found on the property. Uh, of this species, the black cockatoo, uh, and because of the photograph uh, that was taken, they were able to identify the uh, tree that the man was climbing up into, and they were they found a nest there, and they were able to retrieve eggshells and feathers from this nest. So now, the wildlife forensic uh, science people uh, went into action. And they an analyzed the data, uh, the DNA from the nestling, and from samples they retrieved from the nest. And this analysis revealed that the nestling's DNA matched the DNA from the nest samples. So they could prove that the bird really were was taken from the nest. Um, and because it is illegal. Like I said before, uh, this is a species uh, that is um, uh, under uh, Appendix uh, 1 or Appendix 2. It's, it's, it, so it's illegal under the CITES and the Wildlife Conservation Act from 1950 to be captured in the wild. Uh, this was that what the man did was uh, not lawful, and he in fact pleaded guilty, and he was fined 1,000 Australian dollars plus the court costs and the people took away the ladder, uh, the officials uh, took away the ladder and um, uh, the bird uh, cages that he had on these properties. For the nestling, unfortunately, um, he was uh, imprinted and could not be released into the wild. Imprinted means uh, that happens to uh, especially birds, but other animals as well, that when they are hatched birds, they attach themselves to whomever they see first. So usually, this is, of course, the bird parents. So the nestling attaches itself to the bird parents and follows them around and accepts them as their parents. But when a bird is captured by humans, and the first thing it sees and has interaction with is humans, he attaches or he or she attaches themselves to this human who takes care of them and then they cannot be released in the wild anymore because they won't be able um and maybe they don't really identify as a bird i'm not sure about that but it's uh it's not possible for them to survive in the wild so this bird um uh is now held in uh, uh in a facility that takes care of these uh kind of birds so actually, this you can see, this is a loss for the wildlife. There was a bird taken, and this is now not longer part of the of the community of wild birds. 
Uh, and you can see also $1,000 does not seem that much, actually, to me at least. It does not seem to be uh, so much in the cost. Uh, and this is also a problem while there are so many cases of uh, wildlife crime is because the enforcement of the laws and the punishment to you receive afterwards are in many cases fairly mild and enforcement is not really the main focus uh, of police and authorities. So that is why we have so much trouble with wildlife trade and uh, wildlife crime. So. The next uh, case I'm going to present you is uh, takes place in Africa, uh, and there uh, somebody legally caught uh, uh, bought uh, uh, somebody in the United Arab Emirates bought wild beasts, which is legal. So these are these kind of animals that uh, fall under uh, the CITES appendix, maybe uh, appendix two. Uh, so they have to be the trade has to be monitored um, or uh, appendix uh, three where it's not illegal to trade but somebody some country has uh, asked for help in controlling the trade so you can actually legally buy wild beasts uh, uh, which are magnificent animals I think the problem here was that when the wild bees arrived uh, to the man in the United Arab Emirates, he discovered that they had uh, been infected with secoptic mites. This is a small parasite that sets, uh, puts itself into the skin uh, of a mammal and then causes, you can uh, see that here, um, it's really awful. Uh, they get The skin gets really uh, thick uh, and the animal gets very weak uh, and itches all the time and um, if the infection is really bad then the animal usually dies. And this is quite serious if you import from one country um, an animal that is infected with something like secoptic mites, you might introduce a sickness or a parasite into a new area from which it was absent before. So that's why it's not a uh, not legal to uh, trade animals that have been infected with something that are sick. So the people um, who were the ones who traded in the wild bees, who sold the wild bees, of course said, no, 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 uh, this wild bees, they, they were um, healthy when they left us. The, the infection must have happened uh, at home with this guy here from the United Arab Emirates. So um, the aim of this case was to determine the geographic origin of the secoptic mite. And what they did was that they took samples, here you see a picture of the results already, they took samples from wild bees in Kenya, which is very close to Tanzania, they took uh, samples from the wild bees uh, that um, were, um, you know, the subject that were uh, bought. They took a sample from a rabbit from the United Arab Emirates who was infected with mites. And they took samples from uh, chamois in Italy. And then they looked at, okay, these mites, where do they probably, where do they come from? And you can see here that the mites from um, the wildebeest from Tanzania, so the ones that were traded, they were genetically very similar to the wildebeest mites from Kenya. And they were not at all similar to the mite collected from the rabbits uh, from the United Arab Emirates, and they were not at all genetically like the mites collected from uh, chamois individuals from Italy. So the conclusion in this case was that the wild beast were in fact infected with secoptic mites before they were sold to Tanz uh, from Tanzania to the United Arab Emirates. Um, I'm not sure what happened to the people who sold these wild bees, but it is certainly illegal, so I'm expecting that they received a fine uh, because they shouldn't have sold these individual these uh, wild beasts when they were infected. You can treat sarcoptic mites, so it's uh, fully possible um, uh, yeah, 
to wait until their their animals are healthy again and then trade with them if you want to. So this was actually a less severe case, but one that could have quite large consequences for wildlife species if these mites um, were, were released into the wild. And that's why it's so important to control uh, that species, plants or animals that are traded across the world that they are healthy and do not carry any um, infections with them or parasites with them. You probably all heard of cases, for example, uh, wasn't there a few years back with the swine flu, for example, or the bird flu. These are these cases where, where one parasite gets carried across the world and then may infect wildlife uh, with very dire consequences. And the last case I'm going to present now is uh, actually uh, happened here in the lab where I work. So during a summer night in the year 2008, a man in southern Norway was woken by a by dog barking and a shot. And the day after, there was blood, blood found on the ground and signs of something being dragged across the ground. And officials immediately suspected that there was illegal um, uh, illegal hunting going on. So a police investigation was started, and they found blood. Here's a picture from the blood on the ground, and they found hair samples at the crime scene. And the DNA laboratory here in uh, Svanhoft, here where I work, was already um, operational. So we analyzed the DNA, and we could confirm that yes, this blood comes from a bear and because we have analyzed so many bears here in our lab already we could even identify it we could say oh yeah this bear it was called uh, he27 this is a bear that we have analyzed before um, the police then went to the property of um, some people that were uh, suspected to have done the deed and they found under the house they found a gun so the people have hid had hidden the gun underneath a house there and they found blood on the gun so they took blood samples from this gun and sent those blood samples also to us and when we analyzed them we could confirm that yes, the blood on this gun matches the DNA of this individual. And this was actually used in court um, to give evidence that uh, the gun, which was owned by the suspect, was actually used to kill this bear. So the end result was that uh, the f there were five men involved. All of them pleaded guilty. Uh, the guy who owned the gun was convicted to 90 days in prison. He had to pay a fine of 30,000 Norwegian crowns, uh, which is not little, it's a fairly hefty sum. And he was revoked his hunting license for three years. This is something that hurts people a lot here in Norway because hunting is very popular. Um, there were four other people involved and they also received punishment um, related to the degree of their involvement. So the um, one who drove uh, or two who drove the uh, the car, uh, they were fined also to some days in prison and to a fine. The guy who owned the dog was also fined for something, um, but I think not prison. Um, so they received uh, also some punishment. So these were three cases uh, that I wanted to present you as an example, there is a large amount of wildlife crime cases on the net. And if you're interesting, uh, interested in finding out more on this, you may just, you know, if you go to the uh, web pages, there is one um, uh, that is called uh, traffic, uh, for example, traffic.no. 
what it was called. Yeah, I cannot find it out now, but you can always ask me. There's uh, it, that is about uh, wildlife, illegal wildlife trade, um, and there is a vast number of cases where people were caught caught uh, trading wildlife illegally or doing animal cruelty, uh, and very often DNA is helpful, just like on the crime scenes, uh, crime series on TV. So actually, maybe there should be a TV series, uh, Wildlife Crime Lab or something like that. So this uh, is the end of the talk. This is this time only a short one. But if you have uh, questions, um, please put them in the chat and I will try to answer them. <laughs>